It's a real pleasure to welcome to the High Performance Podcast, swimming coach and former athlete Mel Marshall. Mel, nice to have you with us. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to my 70 minute counselling session, boys. <laughs> right, here we go. No, you're doing the counselling. <laughs> what is high performance? Um, I've been listening to all your podcasts and um, I've given myself a chance to sort of answer this. And for me, like high performance is the outcome. And to me, how you get high performance is about the process. And to me, it's finding, it's evolving, it's delivering the best version of yourself, your culture, your environment, your people every single day at a sustainable long-term and short-term pace. And that to me is, is like I say, what high performance is. High performance is the outcome and the process of how you get there is the interesting part of the journey. Obviously, we've now asked that question to about mm, 50 plus people. I think you're the first person, Mel, who has mentioned evolving in your answer. Because I think one of the mistakes we make as human beings, we find high performance and that's it. We found the formula. Whereas evolution is obviously something that's on your mind when you talk about high performance. So why is that? I think you go to sleep an expert and you wake up a novice. And I just think that if you treat life like that, every day is a journey. And I just think if you look now, the world's your library. You know, I've been out running with you boys for probably 40 runs over the last 18 months. And every time I come back in from those runs, when I hear, you know, people like Joe Malone talking about the art of resilience, when I hear um, Richard, um, the army commander, talking about the power of moral courage, you know, you, you know, you feel yourself evolving every single day. And I think that... Um, it's about a growth mindset. It's about how do you make the best version of yourself every single day? And, and that's what, you know, that's what my life's about as a person, as a performer, as a professional. And, and I, I love it. I literally, you know, I love it. I wake up in the morning and don't get me wrong. I still have the days where I just like, Oh, come on. Is it over yet? But most of the time, the majority of my response is right. What's out there to explore? How can I get better? And how can I win life today? I suppose. And what do you do when you're having one of those ugh days? Well, I put a cold copper berg in the fridge and I wait till 7.30 oh, to get home. That's high <laughs> performance right there. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> so Mel, will you take us back to your origin story? Because I, I, I do know a little bit about your background and I'm interested in when you first developed that growth mindset because you weren't coming from sort of an environment where high performance was necessarily all around you. Yeah. I mean, it comes from my mum and my dad, really. Um, and Jake, I've heard you talk about, you know, your history and your adversity and, and does that, you know, certainly shape you for the future. And I, and I absolutely think it does. Um, you know, my mum, I won't go into too much detail, but she's had, um, you know, a few challenges around physicality over the over the years. And she sort of sat me down when I was about nine years of age and she looked at me across the kitchen table and she said to me, look, you've got two arms at work you've got two legs that work, you've got energy and you've got enthusiasm. Go out and give the world the very best you've got and don't come home until you have. And that sort of, that was really born in my childhood. And then I have an, an over-competitive father who literally would not want to lose anything. And, um, you know, there was just no mercy. It was like, no, you can go in goal and I, the 35-year-old strong man, will strike the ball at 100 mile an hour <laughs> and you will learn to cope and I, the professional tennis, table tennis player, will not teach you how to serve. I will just serve at you. But that in itself was a, a life lesson. It was a competitive hurdle I had to get over. And it was the foundations of me, my competitive you know, nature, really. Um, and interestingly, I, you know, I fought and fought and fought. And, you know, the day that I did beat him, he stopped racing. Um, so, yeah. He retired. So, yeah, he retired. So he goes like, basically, no, we're not. We're not, we're not running racing anymore. We're not swimming racing anymore. So, but again, I thank both my parents for, you know, what they taught me in those real key lessons and, you know, competition's the bread of life, isn't it? And I, I love being competitive and I've had to learn how to, you know, what, how to be competitive and also be compassionate as, as life's gone on. So, yeah, I think that's the foundations of, of where I've come from. And I was really lucky that, um, I have a best friend. I had a best friend called Daniel and he had a condition called muscular dystrophy. And it was a very, very severe um, 
disability and he he lived he was given the prognosis to live to the age of 12 he lived in my village and I went to school with him and you know we did think you know did things that kids do and and I was surrounded and it was probably the most inspirational story I've ever been witness to living was his mum and dad called Paula and Stuart they never saw that he was supposed to make it till 12 they they said right we accept this challenge and we're going to make the very best of this boy's life. And you know, he passed away at 36 years of age. And But he met Rihanna. He met every single Tottenham player. He went to every um, football game. You know, he came to me to, with me to watch my championships. And they would hang out all the Star Wars, the Game of Thrones. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. Um, it's almost like he's a member of Hollywood or something. <laughs> but to me, like people like Dan and Paula and Stuart, they're the real life people in this world that are, you know, given a, a challenge in hand, but they make the decision to accept the situation and find the most positive resolution. Um, and I would say that, you know, that is, that's kind of, that's me really. That's a little bit part of my DNA. Yeah. So when did you discover your talent for swimming then? Because like Jake said in the introduction, you were a, a an incredible athlete uh, in your own right. So tell us a little bit about that journey of discovery. Well, for me, um, you know, I, I started swimming when I was around seven years of age. Uh, again, there was there's some sort of, kind of history around my, my parents and whether or not I had a, a physical condition that would maybe show later on in life. So it was basically like, um, right, swimming exercises all the muscles, so you're going swimming. Uh, that journey started at four. The first fallout with my dad started at five because the independent female in me at five was convinced that she knew how to swim on her own and proceeded to drown in the small pool in Spalding. And, um, you know, then I just went three or four times a week and then I saw a swimming club and I started, they were in two lanes and I was in the public lane. And then I was like, right, I'll try and beat them. They kind of spotted me and, um, and then I, and I went from there really. And then again, that sort of competitive animal in me was just like, right, I want to win the lane. I want to win my age group. I want to win the club. I want to win the, be the best in the club. And I want to um, then be the best in the county and just never really gave up. Just like my boss now says I'm like a Jack Russell with a really good bone. I just never give up. Um, The obvious question, Mel, is why? Like, why why did you feel you had to win? um, Because it's just who I am. It's uh, I've just that's what I do. I guess it's I've just always wanted to be good I've always wanted to be the best version of myself I've always wanted to win and again probably because my dad would never let me that you know seven eight nine ten year old development for me was like well I'm going to find a way to win here no matter what it takes and the level is really high and I've got to get to that standard and so that's that's just in me and I have to watch myself now because (laughs) I literally um I, I work obviously you know you're talking to Adam later but I work with him and and we're both competitive animals, and but it's all about the uniform that you decide to put on. And I talked to him about this. I'm like, Adam, you know, you need to be a competitive warrior. That's who you are. But when you're on the bread aisle with a 92-year-old lady who is also trying to get the last bit of bread, you need to select what uniform that you've got on. Um, and that's that. That's me. And I guess I've had to. It's a blessing and it's a curse. And like most people, you have a. There's the little Mel, isn't there? And then there's the big Mel. And you often to find the best version of yourself. The little Mel with the insecurities and the little fighter is in there. And then you try and overtake it with the the Mel that's kind of evolving and growing as time goes on. And you went from you know your parents setting you challenges to to struggling in that pool in Spalding to wanting to be the best at the club. You ended up as the best in the world, winning gold medals, traveling to major tournaments, and then you became a coach. So now you coach arguably the best swimmer on the planet. And I think if you speak to anyone, they will talk about the importance of, of your role in his success. Um, and I'm sure you'll be modest and play that down, but it, but it can't be denied. So what is it about being a coach that works for you? We had someone on the podcast called Susie Ma who spoke about infinite purpose. You may have heard it, where it's just the never ending purpose in your life. So as a coach, what do you see as your infinite purpose? Well, I'll take you back to where I started and found my reason why. So in the Olympic Games in 2004, 
you know, I went into the Olympic Games ranked fastest in the world and I came out with a broken heart as, you know, they only give out 56 medals every Olympics and most people will leave with a broken heart. Um, good old games. That It's all good fun, good statistics. Yeah. Um, anyway, I digress. But yeah, my reason why I was born from that moment because the competitor in me said, I, I think I can do a, a much better, not much better, but I think I can do a, a really good job for athletes with everything that I know now that I've had frontline experience of. I think that I can do a really good job for athletes. Um, that coupled with my competitive spirit, that coupled with my probably innovative coaching thinking, um, that that's sort of how I found myself into coaching. And sustainable success is founded upon sustainable questioning and um this sort of thirst and drive to just try and get better. And, you know, there's, there's winning once and there's winning twice and there's winning better each time. And you've always got to, and I, me and Adam talk about this regularly, but you've always got to start the next one with nothing. And so you earn it all again. Um, and that taps into your ego, that taps into your technicality, that taps into your, your processes. But to me, I think that's how I found myself in coaching. And my reason why has always been really strong is I want to illuminate people to flourish on the highest of stages. I want to challenge people when they get that platform to do great things with it. And um, my reason why is very much about just help giving people wings to roots to grow and wings to fly. And Damien, you've said that to me before and I've stolen it. So um, if that gets some good intellectual property and hits, that's courtesy of Damien Hughes about two years ago in a <laughs> service station somewhere. So Love that. Could you go a bit deeper on um, what was it you said? Sustainable success comes from sustainable questioning. Yeah. So like I said earlier, you, you go to bed an expert and you wake up a novice. And when you've got, a performance that is that is good, that is world leading, you really have to manufacture and know what to manufacture to get your motivation to keep questioning, keep asking, is there more? How do we find it? When you're on the run the first time, it's all new and it's all, we can try this and we can do that and we will get this. When you're trying to do it for the fourth, the fifth, the sixth time, you really have to manufacture that almost like uncomfortableness as in, no, it's not, it's not good enough. How do we have that critical conversation? What is the elephant in the room that we need to discuss? What is that, you know, conversation that we've not had or what is that technicality I don't understand that I'm frightened of the detail you've really got to push yourself to you know because it could quite easily just float along and you could just ride this this kind of high but if you want more you have to be more and if you want it to look better it has to be better yes. um and so that for me is that's that's the point really I love that so, so can I, because you pushed over there, that 2004 experience, Mel, but I'm yeah. fascinated in terms of going back to that, that you were that competitive animal that was going in there as a favourite for those Athens games. What happened then that enabled you to discover that that powerful sense of why? I think looking back now, and I actually... I actually did an auto ethnography on the relationship between stress and burnout. And there's a whole host of reasons of which I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a place now where I'm incredibly thankful for it. Um, but to me, the thing that I would summarize that situation with is balance, you know, in terms of when you, uh, Jake, I've, you've got a real thirst. I can see when you talk to other people around that thing with, you know, a dad and a high achiever, a dad and a high achiever, and it, and it kind of pulls you either side. And what I learned through those Athens Olympics was the power of balance. How can you push to the highest heights, but also sustain your integrity, sustain the things that matter to you, sustain the pace in which you travel out through your work? Um, and that was the thing that that taught me was the power of balance and everything. And you've got to know what your inner balance is, because I think that some people have the ability to churn work and it doesn't compromise certain things. I think once it compromises your happiness, your well-being, your ability to drive harder, then you need to recheck where your balance is. But I think that answers your question, Damien, around, you know, what the Athens Olympics teach me about high performance. It was the power of making sure you make progress, but how you maintain a balance to strike your hardest punch. So you've got that in terms of me completely right, Mel. This this push and pull constantly between fatherhood and wanting to go out and be a high achiever, and the big picture about what's it all about. The answer I always come back to is it should just be about being a dad. But then 
I feel like it, there's something else there as well. So I'm 42 and have not been able to find the answer. What What are the questions that I'm maybe not ans- asking myself about how to how to get the balance? Do you think? Um, I think it's it's almost like um, maybe it's not the questions you're asking of yourself. Maybe it's the questions you're asking the people around you. Um, and also, if if I it's the, when you're pushing for um, that's a great question. You've caught me off there, Jake. Um, <laughs> The um, I think the thing is, it's ask the people around you, but also it's a, it's a constant checking in, um, because you know ultimately. You, what with yourself or with with other people? Everybody, your team, you know, and the team involves your home team and your your professional team, and I think it's about how you regularly check in. Like it's almost like you. We presume family and friends will just always be there. We don't we don't ring, we don't check in, but yet at work we would do every kind of debrief that you would ever imagine to make things better. Yet in our personal lives, we like stop the debrief because we just presume, oh, that's ticked, that's all set up. Well, I just think if you want your relationships to evolve, if you want family to evolve, you want your personal life to evolve, it's how you debrief and keep having conversations about the things that matter. And again, just keeping that balance in check and sometimes we're actually doing a better job than we think. And sometimes it's okay to strive and be the role model in what it is to try and be the best version of yourself. And, you know, I think that's okay. So, so you, your, your job basically, right, is to win medals for Adam and to help him win Olympic gold around now. So what if you feel that mm, he's not spending enough time with his newborn child or I'm not sure that he's caring enough about his friends who've always been there for him? Do you have that conversation with him, which kind of might cause even more issues for you winning the medals because you're actually saying, go and have some home time? Yeah, well, I think when I started coaching, I was very in tune with my moral purpose straight away. And to me, people comes before performance. And if you put people before performance, performance will take care of itself. So if Adam's happy, if Adam's in check with his family, if Adam's home team's good, um, if Adam's feeling like his, you know, his energy cup is being filled with the right things, you know, he will perform. And that's the bit to me that I take care of first. You know, whenever Adam, you know, achieves things, I'm, I'm always super, super happy for him because, God, he's an incredible athlete to work with. Um, but to me, the win is that when he walks away from this, he'll be able to reflect and go, I did it right. And when I ask him the question at the end of his career, who are you without those medals? If he can answer me that, then I've won in coaching. Because to me, medals is one part of the balance. The person is the 110% the other part. And my job as a coach and that community coach in my heart that I am, that person that's in touch with my moral purpose in this journey of coaching is very much around, they have to be able to answer both. Are you happy with the career that you had? And are you happy with the person you became through the um, triumphs and, and adversities that you faced? And if they can answer yes to both of that, then that to me is all I'll ever need in terms of recognition. So when you finished um, as an athlete then, Mel, were you able to answer both of those questions? It took me time, Damien. Uh, it took me some hurt. It took me some anxieties. It took me some, you know, some lost space. But in the end, I was. And one of my proudest moments, actually, as an athlete was um, when I finished. You know, I mean, a lot of people won't know because, um, you know, swimming is a little bit less high profile. But, you know, our Olympic relay team came ninth and we had rested two athletes. And one of those was the Olympic champion and one of those was an Olympic finalist. And effectively, we probably could have got an Olympic medal. And I remember off that ninth place whereby we just watched it. We just watched it unfold in front of our eyes. And I remember swimming down afterwards in my last swim, which was what was going to be ever. And I just remember thinking, you've done all right, you have. You know, and the reason I, I found that space was because of the traumas that I experienced in 2004 and the reflection space that I'd given myself after that. And it came down to this. If you try your 110% best at something, you never fail because you don't let yourself down. You'll win some, you'll lose some, but you'll never ever fail because you've given your very best. And if I look back at my athletic career, I wouldn't change anything. I wouldn't try anything different because I look back and go, I give it my best. 
I didn't win all of them. I didn't lose all of them. But every time I stood up there, I stood up there with integrity and passion and my very best effort and my heart and soul on my sleeve. And I'm proud of that. My mum's proud of that. And that's all I really need, really. So who, so who helps you now then as a coach? So now that we transfer from you're not an athlete, now you're a coach and a person. Who, who coaches you now with that, with keeping those questions honest and allowing you to retain that balance? Uh, my coaching mentor, who I have on speed dial, uh, I've been working for seven years. Um, and I have this sort of like, I can be pretty logical and systematic with the way that I go about things, but to actually get there and get rid of the frustration and anger I sometimes feel, I need a, I call it like a, it's an offload to a reload. So I need to offload my frustrations to reload my actions. Um, and for me, um, you know, that the coaching mentor, I've had some great people that I've, you know, I've grown up through swimming with. Um, and also as well, you know, a, a lot of the, I talked to a lot of people. I, I went on a journey a couple of years ago, Damien, as you know, because I came and interviewed you. And again, just, I went and I was a bit lost in my leadership and I was like, what do I need? What do I want? Where am I at? Who am I? Where do I sit in this kind of, this new role? And I just went and, it, you know, I spent time with 24 different leaders from different places you know including people like alex ferguson eddie jones yourself um adrian morehouse some really great people and i just felt myself growing from that experience so i guess when i'm i'm lost and i don't know how to find the answers to me sometimes winnie the pooh is right sometimes the best thing to do is to do nothing and then sometimes the other side is you have to find the answers that you don't you don't have and sometimes that explorative space where you don't quite know what you're looking for. Like when I'm not sure whether I want to go on a run and then I go on a run with a high performance podcast, I'm like, I wasn't sure that I was looking what I was looking for, but actually thank you, Joe Malone this morning for telling me what you've told me, you know, thank you for, um, yeah. So I think it's, to me, it's that always have someone that you can be a sounding board to, so you can offload to reload, take time to explore, Sometimes you don't know what you're looking for until you explore. And the third one is um, just keep asking questions, keep checking in. What answer did you find, Mel, when you had that that time out and you went and spoke to all those people? Well, it's interesting. And Damien, you absolutely nailed it. And like you literally, I don't think you quite understand how thankful I was after that conversation around how you you basically put a framework around a lot of lost thoughts Um and I was, I'd come from a, a program where I was, where my position in my leadership role was all up front, all doing everything, you know, all singing and dancing. And then, and then I came into a system, which is an amazing system. Um, but I was like, I'm not sure where my role is here. And the, the culture was st- still a great culture, but it was a different culture to what I had delivered when, when I delivered it as the, the sort of the leader of my program. Um, but once I found out what rules I was playing against, I was able to come up with this kind of new skill set. So I'm trying not to go off, off here, but Damien, you've talked about it before. I am a 110% commitment culture leader. That's just who I am. Now I sit inside a system that isn't like that, but it's still working incredibly well. I've had to learn how to lead in a different way. Like I'm very upfront leader, whereas I've had to learn how do I invisibly lead here? How do I influence? How do I create the changes that I want and not get the recognition that I would like, which is really important for me as a person to sort of like be seen. Oh, it's love for me, you know, leadership, you know, in my old role, I felt a lot of love. Um, and so I had to learn this kind of new skill set of, right. Okay. Mel, put your ego out of the way. And it's not about you and you're not going to save the day and come in here on your giant horse. Um, you have to learn how to make the changes quietly and, and influence around the edges. And so um, that was one of the things I learned. Uh, also with those guys, the people that I met, what a fascinating group of people, but authentic- authenticity was the thing that I learned. You know, I met 24 great people, but none of them did it the same way. And I think, authenticity is incredibly important, but it's how you have the education and knowledge and mastery to deliver your content and your communication and the way you go about your business in your authentic way. And I think that's where you really take people with you when you can have all of those things. 
Um, but amazing things are like people like Catherine Granger, just on the, the opening call was just like sport matters incredibly and deeply to this country. And I'd forgotten that. And then people like um, Chelsea Warrior was head of performance for UK sport. She just said, you need to know yourself, your inner self and how you're projecting to everybody else. And just amazing things like, like that, like, Paula Dunn, who's in British Para-Athletics, she said how to give critical, difficult feedback with emotionally sensitive preparation and delivery. And just, oh, I was just... I was I'm like, making what? notes like you wouldn't believe right here. <laughs> <laughs> Would you just explain the importance, of, you know, through the work with Damien as well, of a commitment culture? For people listening to this, you know, we have a lot of teachers, we have a lot of business leaders, we have a lot of people working in teams and they're always looking for, for help and advice when it comes to cultures. What is it? Why does it work so well for you? Um, I think it works for Mel for, so well for me is because it, it aligns with my moral purpose. And I think if you're in line with your moral purpose and you're in line with your reason why, I, I think there's this, this 10% factor, the 20% factor that you can get out out of people for no finance, for no, for nothing, just because they're all aligned to one mission and it's really easily seen. I always talk about the endurance of parents. So when I was in my old club job, you know, the endurance of some of these parents at five in the morning till seven at night, selling on the Tom Bowler to help raise funds, helping with charity missions, you know, helping at the meets and stuff. I'm like, their moral purpose was, sounds really, really soft and flake, but love. And they were so in line with their, you know, the how much they loved their children and how much they loved what their children were doing. They gave you an extra 20%. And I just think it, it comes back to that is you, it comes back to me is like, you've, you to create a real commitment culture, you have to lead, inform and inspire people to fall in love with the same things that are important to you, but also to fall in love with the journey they're going to go on um, to reach a destination and, even if you win or lose at the end of the destination, the journey that you create to get there, they will always look back on as something that, God, I'm glad I took that opportunity. And how common is like phrases like love? Because I'm interested in that club period where you were delivering phenomenal results, but you had the chance to shape it. How, how unique was that in your experience, Mel? Um, I, I think it... <laughs> I think a lot of people do it. I think when you look at the volunteer, you know, communities of sport and every, and people, you know, people do it for the love. They don't do it for, you know, the finance or anything. But if I look at why was that pro, so why did we deliver uh, the impossible in, a, in an impossible, why did we yeah. make something possible in an impossible situation? And it really was, Damien, it was just about daring to love something, naively pursuing it and just not giving up on it. And if I look at, the love and passion and commitment I gave the kids, the parents, the committee in those, you know, those first six years of my job. And then I look at what I needed in the last two years of my job and how much I got back. Oh, it was tenfold. Even now, if I ring one of the parents that I, you know, Rihanna Sheehan's dad, you know, I took a, his daughter from 12 all the way to 18. She had a great journey. If my, if my gas boiler went in the middle of the night, he would come and help me because, and I, I gave, I gave my full commitment and, you know, full passion and everything to, to those kids at the time. So I think it's what we're so afraid of now is we live in a society and systemically, if there are, Klopp spoke about it the other day, if there are a hundred things that go well, most people pick up on the one thing that's not great. And I just think that we get crushed and crushed and crushed. But I think you've just got to keep coming with the 99 things that are great every day and find those things and not let the one thing crush you down. Um, one of my swimmers said to me once, kill them with kindness. And God, it's powerful. It's like, you know, when that road rage person comes across and tries to, you know, cut you up. I remember being dressed as an elf one Christmas and I thought, <laughs> you know what? I'm going to kill this guy with kindness because I'm going to get out and dance in the middle of the road like an elf. And everyone was like cheering in the area. But it's just like, you know, I was in control of the situation because I was like, I'm going to kill you with some kindness here, mate. Love it. So, um, so what, go on, Demi. No, go on. I was going to ask then in terms of, would you tell us some of the successes then that you had in that club environment beyond the obvious of seeing Adam and his emergence. I'm interested in some of those other human stories. Like I love the idea of, uh, of, of, you know, the guy coming to fit your gas boiler. Yeah. What sort of stories that, that still light you up and 
and, and, and can keep you warm at night? Oh, there's so many, Damien. And, you know, I'm a community coach. I'm a performance coach, but there's still a community coach in me at heart. And, um, you know, I took a group of kids and they were from the age of 12 and I saw them all the way through to 18, really. And there were so many stories of triumphs, but we had this mantra of you're going to go to your Olympics, whatever that might be. That might be the county championships. That might be the actual Olympic Games. There's no ceilings. There's no boundaries. I just want your energy, enthusiasm and your constant commitment and we'll get you to your Olympics, whatever that might be. That might be to finish swimming and go on to college. That might be to do your A-levels and balance that out with swimming at the same time. Um, and, and if I look at what came out of that program, I started that program and it had... 12 regional standard swimmers. I had four lanes, I had dodgy lane ropes, I had 30 meter pool that had not been emptied in 45 years, that would regularly break. Um, and and, and the, in the end, I left, I had Adam who won the Olympics. I had a young guy called Lewis who got a bronze at the, Par- at the Paralympics in the same year. I had two kids on scholarships to America. Um, I have kids with thousands and thousands of memories around what we did. Like we would go, there was no gym facilities. So we would just run in the the local um, town center. And at Christmas, I'd make everybody dressed up as Santa Claus, including Kyle's dad who hated, um, who hated running. And we would have all the kids around the city of center of Derby, just running around as Santa Claus. And I'd have them doing, you know, Christmas challenges. Now in my little mind, it was like, well, actually, if I pretend by taking them bowling and doing fun barbecues, then what I'll do is I won't lose a week of training before Christmas when they all normally slack it off. So, um, but there was a real good story around a girl called Fran Baldwin and she, she works for me now and she's a master's student at Loughborough. And now Fran, she wasn't the most talented swimmer and she was one of three, um, three girls and her dad brought her the first time. And he was like, um, look, we're not getting too involved. We're going to go a couple of times a week, eight years down the line. He's got one kid in America. He's been on the team manager for seven trips and all that sort of stuff. But anyway, so Fran Baldwin just really encompasses everything that we tried to do in that program, because I think we got her to her Olympics, which was a national championships. And she, you know, the qualification standard that she needed to do, she was the anchor leg in the relay and she just blew something out of nowhere. Um, but that to me is the power of sport. And you can have all the technical manuals in the world and all of the detail from all of the best scientists in the world, but it's human connectivity, it's enthusiasm, and it's emotion that finds those brilliant moments. You look at the pyramids, right? You didn't see a you didn't see a spreadsheet there, did you? You saw like we want to do this and we're going to get all these people in one place with a great vision and we're going to make something impossible happen. And that's what people go to work for. They go to work for that human connectivity and and that you know, that moment, like that's the beauty of sport in it, guys. It's like, it's the only thing left whereby because of the cutthroat nature of it in some ways, but it lifts people out of their seats in the living room. It's so good when it comes off, you know, it's like those stories of triumph and, and misery and suffering and how people have found a way through. And I think it just makes me think about the Olympics this summer. And I just think, the NHS has been in charge of health and what a job it's done. But I feel my moral purpose this summer is sports in charge of hope. And I, I feel very, very proud to, you know, take the hope for the nation into a summer games and go and get and show people, you know, despite the world going stationary, there's been some people that have found a way to find amazing performance. And, you know, I feel so proud of, um, you know, the guys that I work with and what we've been through and and how we can potentially provide some hope this summer that, you mm. know, things can, things, can, things can still move at a fast pace. So inspiring. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to us like this. It is, it is wonderful to sit here. And as I, I keep worrying that I'm looking down, I'm only making notes, right? It's not, <laughs> I'm not listening. There's so many things I want to sort of take out from this. I'm just writing down about uh, the pyramids being a good lesson for us to realise that it's not all about spreadsheets and, and, and mathematics equations. Um, you sit here and talk to us and you are so sort of deeply connected emotionally to your athletes, to your sport, to your sort of infinite purpose, to what you want to achieve. Um, and I think that, of course, you still do the real hard stuff. We'll talk about that in a minute, about how you really get someone like Adam to dig so deep that he doesn't feel he can go any further and you push him a little bit further than that. But you clearly have so much to give, so much to offer as a female. So why are only 10% of elite coaching roles filled by women? 
What's going on here? I think it's a really interesting question. And I'm glad that we are starting to now ask the question because I think if we ask the question, we can start to find the solutions. Um, to me, I think it's about it's about platforms. It's about creating role models. I think it's about putting people in positions whereby they have the opportunity. You know, some research would suggest that they would employ a male based on what they think he can do, whereas a woman has to have already done it, which is an interesting concept. I used to be a bit blind to all this because I'm I'm probably just quite hell bent and tough. But if I look at, I have had to be extraordinary to get into the position that I've been in. And I just think it's about why do people have to be completely extraordinary to be in a, in a good position? Why can't they just be, you know, really good and ordinary? If I look at the battles that I've had to face over the years and it's, it's, it's some of them have been quite extraordinary and we should make it much easier. It shouldn't be, this, it shouldn't be difficult to um, try and bring yourself to the forefront when you've got a good skill set. And the other side of that is we have to be good enough. Like I'm, I'm a big believer of you don't just get the job because of, you know, we should be ticking boxes. We need to be good enough. And I think that if we start talking about it and creating opportunities for people to be good enough, that's a really nice, that's a really good starting point. And what are the things that as a female coach you offer that no matter how much a male coach will try, they, you don't think they can, or is, or is that, is that not something? I just think, and any good coach um, has a coaching toolbox, any good leader has a leadership toolbox. You know, a good leader knows how to be the disciplinarian, the teacher, the priest, the counsellor. It's all those kind of things. And if I, I summarise this, and I, it's much thicker and deeper than just men and women, but I think there's feminine qualities to leadership and coaching, and I think there's masculine qualities to, to leadership and coaching. And I think a good coach has the breadth to be able to flex across all that spectrum. So to me, a more masculine trait would be autocratic, um, direct, uh, and quite disciplined in the way that they would give feedback. A more feminine way of doing it would be empathetic, understanding, questioning, and listening. And to me, a good coach should be able to do what you would class as feminine qualities and masculine qualities. And I, if I look at me, I would say it's much as a, as a as a female, I think I've got a good skill set when it comes to you know providing direction, setting clarity, and and having those tough and challenging conversations. And I'm also good at crying and showing empathy. And if I asked a, a male coach, I'd be like, "Have you ever cried in front of your athletes?" And I've my my S and C coach, who I love to bits, he was like, "I haven't cried in like seven years. It's a problem." Um, so it's. Um, I just think it's about how you go into your coaching toolbox and you realise that there are potentially more masculine ways of doing it and more more feminine and, and explore those feminine traits. of. But both male and female coaches can offer both 100%. traits. 100%. It's, it's a skill. Like you're an actor and like you need to be able to act in every role and you need to be authentic and, and know your content. You know, Matthew McConaughey talked about when he went into that role and he, and he winged it the first time, but when he owned who it was, it then became authentic. Um so to me, it's about being able to do the whole spectrum and range, you know, your ability to do what you would like. You know, sometimes my coaching mentor uh, would say to me, say, look, you need to get better at, you're really good at damsel in distress and you're really good at Iron Maiden. You struggle with the bits in between. And it's the same thing, you know, as if you're a male coach and a female coach, if a male coach, you might be really good at, you know, the Iron Maiden, but are you good in the asking for help and showing the, your vulnerabilities and showing your insecurities around certain things. Um, and I think that's, that's probably, it's, I think that, I don't know if that answers your question, Jen. No, it does. Yeah. Absolutely. But do you get feedback from your athletes and Mel? And would you tell us about how you go and ask for that? Absolutely. Um, you know, I'll, like me and Adam actually sat down. It's a great session. Me, him, and the um, psychologist. Um, uh, it was two weeks ago, and I just wanted to check in on our relationship. You know, we've been working together for twelve years. It's kind of changed shape over time, and we just sat down and you know ordered a gourmet kitchen, kept it nice and informal, which I do think's you know a beautiful place for really shaping people's behaviour or change and influencing people. And we just talked about stop, start, continue. So I said, okay, Adam, in our relationship, what do you want to stop? What do you want to start? And what do, you continue, want, what do we want to continue? And then I did the same exercise for him. You know, we talked about the Olympics, you know, our arena skill set together. I said, what do we want to stop? What do we want to start? And what do we want to continue? 
And we, it was supposed to be a 45 minute session. We were in there for an hour and a half. And, and then what we finished with was like almost like a positive affirmation for one another. Okay, what's our super strengths? So Adam, what do you think my super strengths are? And then my task was to, to basically say to Adam, okay, my, I, I feel like your super strengths are. Because again, back to your point, Jake, about being a dad, really, we forget to come to the forefront with the things that we think are amazing about the people that we're with on an intimate level. Mm -hmm. And, you know, me and Adam have worked together for 12 years. And so, you know, that relationship is, you know, seven hours a day. It's, it's, it's got a whole shape of, you know, complexities, but we have to make the time to remember why it's such a good relationship and why it still works and why, and also revisit it and how can we evolve it and how can we just keep it in check? Um, and I would regularly, you know, do different things in different ways for other athletes about how I check in, how I'm doing for them, what do they need? Um, but someone, a wise owl told me once as a coach, you've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. Listen twice as much as you talk and then you might start to think you're being a decent coach. So applying that principle then, Mel, what would you say has been the best piece of feedback you've had from one of your athletes? Um, pr probably Adam, actually, um, just around he wants the feedback quick, he wants it honest and he wants it in a safe environment. So he doesn't, you know, if I'd said to him in the past, you know, I was... Um, I didn't know how much how much honesty he. I was always I would always be honest with him, but how much of what I saw he wanted to hear, um, in terms. And he was like, I, I want to hear it. Um, now he changes his mind sometimes because he doesn't. Um, but um, yeah, that would probably be the most honest. Um, that one of the best bits of feedback, and also has quite a lot of three hundred and sixty feedback from staff and coaches and athletes. And was what was quite nice about that was I was doing way better than I thought. I thought I was. Uh, which was lovely because I was just like, oh, I actually thought I was much worse than this, but people think I'm actually all right. So, um, because again, as a leader, as a coach, you're the one out front, aren't you? You're often when you're trying to be pioneering and the first time of doing anything, it's like, God, I'm not, I am, I'm actually not quite sure, yeah. but I've got conviction in my choices and I'm, I think it's a calculated risk and we're going to go for it. But you are often, you know, getting that trusted feedback from a source that you respect and knows the situation well enough. I think we get a little bit buzzwordy, don't we, with feedback? It's like, I'll oh, just throw a bit. It's like, no, you have to have it from the people that are the really, really close to you. Yeah. I've got quite a few questions about feedback, if you don't mind, I want to dive into because I think it'll be so useful for people that listen to this podcast to hear. So first of all, you said you weren't sure how much you wanted to hear. Do you start with minimal amounts of feedback? and build it up and get more honest and not necessarily more brutal, but more blunt until you think, oh, I'm not sure this is working and you're watching the athlete's reaction. Or do you start from the other direction where you give them everything and see how, how they react and maybe start to pull it back? I think it goes back to my point earlier when I said about people before performance. And I think when you're giving that feedback, you've got to know, you know, of course, see it, say it, but see it, say it at the right time with the right, with the right understanding of that individual. So I've got, you know, nine athletes and not one of them would receive feedback in the same way. I've got one particular athlete that would be really adverse to receiving feedback. So I think when you give, if ultimately your overall goal is you want that person, that organization, that culture to grow and progress. That's the purpose and intention of your feedback. You have to understand, unless you understand the people that are receiving the feedback, your intention might be good, but it may not be received that way. So I think the question is to ask ask the right question first. Okay, I've, I've got some pretty critical feedback here. How would you like me to deliver this? Is it a right, the right time for you? Um, is it something you want to grow on? Um, give them the choice to receive it. Then that way, not only are they empowered by receiving it, they are empowered by the fact that they made the choice to receive it. So you get a double win. Um, and then the final piece is then um, because it was their idea to receive it, then it's their idea to own it and change it. So it's basically, you know, double manipulation really. But Very smart, very <laughs> smart. So the athlete that doesn't like or d won't accept feedback, um, is it not your job as their, as their coach to coach them in the uh, important ability to accept feedback? Absolutely. And, you know, it, for me, it's also as well, I will always go to a point where I will see that person's capability to grow. So if I think it's going to damage my relationship and they're probably just not at that space yet where they can grow in that, that time, um, then I, I will wait. 
So to me, again, it's the right time, the right ti- the right timing, the right type, and the right place. Mm-hmm. And if it's not the right time for the feedback for them, it's never going to. All you're going to do is damage your relationship. So you have to wait. Timing is massively key. Like I, I saw things. That's hard, some- though, isn't it? Because you just want to give them the feedback and improve them as quick as possible. Absolutely. And we are in a time-based sport. You know, we've got, we live from hundredths to hundredths and, and weeks to week and days to days. But I think if your intuition gives you the, if you know the person well enough, your intuition, you know, sometimes I go back, it sounds really weird, but sometimes the best thing to do can still be to do nothing because your source of feedback is one potential source of source of growth. Also then working it out on their own and that exploratory learning is also a source of growth. Um, and ultimately you've got a, it's risk versus reward. If the risk and you have to have that critical conversation is going to give you a reward mm. and you need to have that critical conversation. If the risk outweighs the reward that you're going to damage it and the person's going to be destructed afterwards and the momentum that they'd already made up was going to be lost. It's still not the right time to give the feedback. My, the final sort of question on, on, on this whole feedback thing is how you give the feedback. What do you do? How do you empower them to come up with the answer? Do you empower them to come up with the answer? Do you just lay it on the line and simply say something's not good enough? Um, again, I go back to the person. Like some, like I have, like I have nine athletes, and one athlete would want, can I have the instructions for what's next and a plan and a detailed A, B, and C, and I'll just do that, and I'm happy with that. Other people want shared ownership of their their journey, and they want to be heard and seen and in, included and ex, and explore with you and go on the journey together. So I guess it's it's knowing you can have a team goal, but you have to have an individual focus. And mm. I think if you have that individual focus and realize that not everybody's the same not everybody's going to get to destination x the same way not everyone's going to get there at the same speed the same time i think then you start really empowering the people that you work with you know you do you at the end of the day and it should be the same principle when you give feedback or what's right for that individual person at this time that's going to create the better performance for the overall collective brilliant um can i ask you one final question about this how different is it giving them feedback on a technical element like you need to improve your breaststroke compared to, let's say you're watching a swimmer and you know they've lost their motivation or they think they're giving 100%, but you actually know that there's more. How, how, do, you, how do, you, do you deliver it differently if it's, uh, if it's something psychological rather than something physical? Absolutely. Because the thing is, the thing is, when you give technical feedback, you're te- critiquing what they do. When you give character feedback, you're critiquing who they are, mm. which is a much more difficult conversation to have. And so I think that's the that's the that's the chemistry piece, the relationship piece, the relationship and how good that relationship really cements how fluid and how connected that communication, how quickly that can happen. So my message on the feedback thing around when you have to have those critical conversations, it's like the power of your relationship at the first space will determine how much feedback and how quickly that can be coped with under stress and pressure. Brilliant. Because I think there's like a really unwritten, I'll, I'll, I think there's a really incredible skill that you have, Mel, that you've taken some of these kids at 12 years of age and now you're dealing with adults and you still have the ability to put their relationships at the front and centre of it. Um, Would you explain a little bit about, because there's lots of parents that listen to this, our teachers, is there a difference in terms of engaging a a child in many effects as, as opposed to dealing with an elite Olympic athlete? Um, there's some similarities and there's some difference. I think for me around parents, it's, I call it the competitive hurdles and loving eyes can never see. So like when you're a parent, I don't know, I have got two jogs and I am crazy about them, <laughs> but I think there's this, you know, reluctance to let, let the kids, let, let the kids get over the competitive hurdles themselves. And if we remove all of the, so if there's a hundred meters track, right? and there are 20 competitive hurdles. And once they've got over those 20 competitive hurdles, they are going to be more full of people, more determined, more capable, more able to cope with the challenges that are going to come their way in adulthood. Then that's a good route for them to go. If parents, coaches remove those competitive hurdles, when they get to the end, when they get to 18, they won't be able to cope with anything because they thought that it was an easy, smooth road. So my thing to anybody that's working with those development years is put as many competitive hurdles in their way 
and effectively help them to get over them, but also if they can't, help them understand why they can't. You know, when Adam was in his young years, people thought I was crazy. I took him on a training camp to Zambia. I took him on a bike ride as well, where we cycled 500 kilometers across Basically, it was 42 degree heat. And the reason I wanted to take him there was because to me, I wanted to help his character understand, you know, life isn't easy. It's not a bed of roses. It is difficult. It is challenging. There will be good days. There will be bad days. People that you know and love will pass away. There will be divorces. There will be um, all those things. And sports, the same thing. There will be wins, there will be losses. And it's just about how you triumph through all of those and accept that that is the journey that you're on. And I just think that less is more. Like, the, I do think now, unfortunately, you know, I use an example. My friend's 23-year-old son, yep, he went to a job interview the other day with 1,400 other people for a 25 grand a year job. He came from a school that basically gave him participation medals when he was younger. So he thinks that, well, I, I participated. I should get something for this. We're setting him up to fail because that's not how the world works when you get past the age of 18. And I just think now we're, we so want to helicopter them out of all the challenges. It's like, no, we have to let them learn and grow from each challenge and just be there to support them through those challenges, not remove the challenges. So there's some brilliant parallels there with, say, reading about what Bob Bowman did when he developed Michael Phelps' character. So the story of him deliberately breaking his goggles before a race to see how he could cope with the adversity of, of having to swim without them or, you know, turning the lights off or not giving him a drink of water. That as an outsider, you might appear cruel or you wonder why you're doing it and you've explained why. Have you ever done anything like that with Adam to develop his competitive instincts and his ability to deal with adversity? Yeah, 100% all the time. That's everything we do. And I think it was Richard Dennett that said about it, wasn't it? It goes in terms of how do you simulate what's required in your practice and do it at a higher level so that when you you know come under pressure, you just revert to type. Um, and albeit it's, the, it's, it's not the same as the military for sure, but that's everything that we do. You know, I would over-prepare Adam so that he would be, the race itself would be easy. And if you listen to him talk now, I mean, um, he talks about, it's just two lengths of the baths, but, you know, it, I can't remember who said it, but it takes, a, it takes a genius to work out to make it that simple in the end. But everything, you know, I've done so many things with him, like, okay, when I took him to Zambia, on a training camp you know when I went to Zambia in the October in this OYDC place the the water in the 50 meter pool was blue when I went in January it was green and it did have no visibility at the bottom and they did say that it would open at eight o'clock and it didn't open till 10 30 so we had to climb over the gates every day they did say there would be breakfast at eight and there was not breakfast ever and they did say there would be cutlery and you would get a fork for your cereal and the purpose when I took those 12 kids to that camp was because I wanted them to cope with you know it's unpredictable but you can either react to it or you could deal with it and what I left there with I left there with 12 soldiers really in some ways 12 life soldiers that were not going to react to what came their way they're just going to deal with it and just you know not make a mountain out of a molehill and then fast forward three years when Adam went to the Rio Olympics he was um they he had all of his kit stolen his technical kit his everything and we had 48 hours now I was running around like a blue ass you know whatever trying to find all the technical kit but he was he was still in the t-shirt that he traveled in three days afterwards with a rash on his armpit but he'd almost he'd got this mantra and developed this mindset through a series of challenges that we'd set him that he was just like if I have to swim in this dirty t-shirt with a rash on my armpit so be it and it's to me I've always said it's about if somebody says the Olympics is now going to be in a shark infested pool with lame ropes, you've got to have the mindset and the character go, I'll be in there first, see it in there. And that's, that's to me, you do that. You know, I just think you train people's character, you train their technicality, you train their character, you train their physicality. But to me, you, how you can positively push and challenge somebody in innovative ways and, take them to new heights that to me is the beauty of coaching mel what a brilliant brilliant episode we're about to move on to our quick fire questions but before we do that the final question for you and this is an interesting one because we normally ask this to the athlete but I, I, having a coach on we can't not ask you the question with your athletes when they're competing what percentage is their success down to their mental approach and what percent is down to the physical side 
Uh, I think it's a balance of both, Jake. I think that you, you can't do one without the other. Um, but I think in terms of reaching your full potential, your your full physical potential is is down to your ability to believe in yourself, your ability to perform under pressure without perceiving stress, uh, and your ability to, you know, bring the best version of yourself to the most difficult situation and deliver. Great. Right. Quick fire questions. Three non-negotiable behaviours that you and all the people around you have to buy into. Effort, fun, and reality. Fun. That's a rare one. I'm pleased it's in there. What advice would you give to a teenage male just starting out? Do it all again, exactly the same way. If you could recommend one book for our listeners and our viewers to get their heads into, what book would you recommend? Oh, it's called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a... <laughs> yeah, it's excellent. It's really, really good. Brilliant. What's your greatest strength and what's your greatest weakness? Uh, greatest strength, I think, is innovative creativity. Uh, greatest weakness is finding the ability to believe in myself when others um, challenge me. Are you happy? 100%. And finally, what's your one golden rule for living a high-performance life? Life is what you give it. Brilliant. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Um, we always have these conversations away from the podcast, me and David, about which is your favourite episode, and we normally come up with about 20, but I think we, we might have just... Your number one. I think we might have just recorded the one that is uh, <laughs> it's top of the list. Mel, um, man, thank you so much. Do you know what? We often say that the, the beauty of this podcast is that we speak to someone like you you're a you're a swimming coach but we haven't even mentioned swimming which shows that you're so much more than just a swimming coach in the same way that your athletes are not just swimmers and the business people are not just business people you know we're all we're basically all people and we're all learning things that can all be applied to everyone else's lives and i promise you there will be tens if not hundreds of thousands of people that will listen to this episode and take away stuff that will improve their lives. So honestly, thank you for being so honest, um, so vulnerable, so open. It is brilliant. Thank you. And if you are, when you have Petey on, say mine's the best ever, see if you can match that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. In fact, we were, we were exchanging a couple of um, comments over WhatsApp while you were talking and we've decided that you've won yourself a, a high performance podcast mug because you've listened to there. the episode as well. How about um, that? Great. And just for you, Jake, <laughs> Jake, um, yeah. I heard what you'd said um, in terms of um, on one of your podcasts around championing, um, you know, like women's sport and in mm. terms of like you'd said about Alex Scott, hadn't you? You know, you'd come from yeah. television where you got gunged and she'd been in part of the game. I just want to thank you for representing that angle. It's it's really powerful. So thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I, I'm a firm believer, and it probably came to me a bit late, really, that being an ally for people, you know, I can't be a woman, can I? But I can be an ally for women everywhere. So um, I think we should all be an ally for each other. So thanks very much for saying that. And that's very kind of you. And Damien, always a ledge. Absolutely. Oh, thanks, Mal. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.